Hi, my name is Arjan Gwalepur. I would like to welcome you to this virtual symposium, Meet the Experts in Therapeutic Bronchoscopy. What I'd like to share with you is a case-based discussion for valve therapy for emphysema. Before doing that, here are my conflicts of interest. Let me get straight into the topic. The concept of endoscopic valve therapy for emphysema is now based on the solid scientific evidence. And it is based on the idea to block ventilation and predominantly obviously inspiration to hyperinflated parts of the lung and by allowing endobronchial or intrabronchial valves to allow expiration, these hyperinflated lobes of the lung can reduce their hyperinflation, the air trapping, and there is volume reduction with all the previously shown and proven benefits in ventilation, perfusion, distribution, the benefits of neuromechanical diaphragmatic um, properties, uh, as well as the consequent improvements and the resulting improvements in exercise capacity, uh, dyspnea, as well as quality of life. For the intrabronchial valves, we also have now a rather recent meta-analysis that has confirmed that based on two large-scale multicenter randomized controlled clinical trials, there is solid scientific evidence with statistically as well as clinically relevant improvements in FEV1. You see the data from a meta-analysis showing these two studies, the IMPROVE study as well as the REACH study, as opposed to earlier trials that did not follow the concept of full lower occlusion as well as including patients with complete fissures only, which are those that have no evidence of collateral ventilation. And the improvements in FEV1 are usually the result of improvements and reductions in residual volume, as you can see here again from the same two studies, both statistically as well as clinically meaningful improvements in hyperinflation and therefore also improvements in quality of life and dyspnea that I've not shown here. Because since this is a case-based discussion, I would like rather to discuss with you who is an ideal patient candidate which patients can be treated with valves and what are the potential outcomes of, it, of this kind of treatment. First of all, we need to keep in mind that in contrast to surgical volume reduction, endoscopic therapy for emphysema using valves can be offered for both patients with upper lobe as well as those with lower lobe emphysema. And you can see here from this report, comparing outcomes in patients with upper versus lower lobe treatment, that the average improvement in FEV1 is almost equivalent. So that's a big advantage of valve treatment compared to surgical treatment, since the NET study, as well as other studies for surgical emphysema treatment have shown that this is most successful in upper lobe predominant only, but for emphysema treatment with valves, which also appears to be certainly less invasive, there is also an opportunity to treat patients with lower lobe predominant emphysema. And I would like to refer to you to this particular best practice uh, recommendation that comes from an expert panel where it includes all the relevant patient selection criteria, uh, also some uh, criteria related to radiology and how to uh, deal with patients in terms of prophylactic therapy and follow-up uh, aspects. And this paper also includes the fact that when we consider patients potentially eligible, we should always keep in mind that patients should be offered this kind of treatment once they have previously received optimal medical management, uh, including both pharmaceutical means, but also primary rehabilitation, vaccination to reduce exacerbation rates, ensuring appropriate therapeutic adherence and inhaler technique. Uh, and if necessary, even for patients, uh, if they're hypercapnic receiving non-invasive ventilation. So offering valve therapy is an opportunity to ensure that patients who fulfill the right selection criteria may benefit and therefore should be selected based on very clear defined um, criteria that I would like to share with you in this slide. Patients who are candidates for valve treatment should have an FEV1 below 45%. We usually consider patients with an FEV1 of below 15% as very high risk candidates. And in those patients, it should be reevaluated much more carefully. 
there should be evidence of hyperinflation, patients should rather not fulfill the criteria for hypercapnia because, first of all, these are patients of a different phenotype. They may have emphysema also as an important radiological phenotype, but usually these are much more patients who appear to have chronic bronchitis. And we know that patients with hypercapnia are at a higher risk of any uh, sort of complications associated with anesthesia uh, and also if there should be um, valve-associated complications. Patients should have some level of preserved exercise capacity. There should be the more or less current stable condition without evidence of severe heart failure, for instance, but also severe and overt pulmonary hypertension should be ruled out. In addition to this clinical, functional, and uh, aspects related to comorbidities, we use computed tomography at chest CT to ensure who is the right candidate to receive valve treatment. But given the fact that the naked eye is less um, sort of not valid, but less um, or, or much more susceptible to errors compared to an automatic quantification uh, of emphysema patterns, there has been an increasing use of digital emphysema quantification aiding in choosing not only the right patient, but choosing the right target lobe. And there are various systems on the market that offer you the proportion uh, of area of the lung that are affected by low attenuation areas. They may offer you a full report, including emphysema pattern, but they also offer you, and I think this is very important to highlight the fact whether or not there is a complete or an incomplete interlobar fissure that is a predictor of outcome because only patients with at least 95% fissure completeness should be offered a valve treatment. Once you have decided to select a patient for valve treatment, you also need to discuss the risk-benefit ratio with these patients, given the fact that we know that particularly patients with successful volume reduction as a result of valve treatment may have a higher risk of a pneumothorax. These pneumothoraxes, fortunately, can usually be treated well with a chest tube placement, but sometimes it is also necessary to remove a valve to ensure that any air leak, which is the result of a pneumothorax, can be treated adequately due to the foreign body implanted into the airways, there may be a slightly higher risk of CUPD exacerbations also within the first couple of months after the treatment and also some other side effects which uh, can be dealt with rather easily, such as any valve migration. There is a certain learning curve there, granulation tissue and or hemoptysis and very rarely post-obstructive pneumonia. In most experience centers, it has been established to choose the right candidates based on a multidisciplinary team and uh, sort of uh, discussion and to include also the uh, potential risk benefit assessment um, for the patient's aspects and also include the patient's aspects of whether or not the patients themselves uh, are willing to undergo any potential risks. But again, keep in mind, compared with uh, previously reported, published, and well-known risks and side effects of surgical volume reduction, endoscopic valve treatment appears to offer advantages that may reach out far beyond a three months or six months improvement in outcomes, but there is also evidence that particularly those patients with a full, complete fissure, so complete uh, all over atelectasis and or sufficient volume reduction are those with higher and better survival. There are at least two reports published now. Both are coming from case series, but the second report from Heidelberg on the right side actually is based on a rather large scale prospective assessment of patients where you also see improvement in overall survival for patients who have had atelectasis, which is a surrogate of successful volume reduction. So having said that, and since this should be a case-based discussion, I would like to share with you three cases uh, and discuss with you the outcome of these cases. First patient is a 70-year-old female candidate. She has a typical smoking history, and on an X-ray, she presented with evidence of bilateral hyperinflation. Patients always undergo a full assessment, including echocardiography, to rule out 
pulmonary arterial hypertension and this patient had a good left ventricular function and no evidence of pulmonary hypertension. She does fulfill the criteria for hyperinflation and she has no evidence of hypercapnia and she was highly symptomatic despite receiving inhaler therapy. She has a number of comorbidities that didn't influence the decision to whether or not uh, implant valves in these candidates. We have performed a quantitative analysis of the chest CT that helps us choosing the right target lobe. And you see a couple of numbers here. I would like to briefly share and go with you through this, um, through this report. What you see here in the first column is the lower volume, second column, fissure integrity, third column, basically the proportion of that um, respective uh, lobe that is affected by um, emphysema using a threshold of minus 920 Hounsfield units. And the, the last column basically is the heterogeneity to the ipsilateral lobe. And what you see here is that this patient has a very severe right lower lobe predominant emphysema. You see here 60% emphysema in the right lower lobe, 41% in the right upper lobe. That's a difference of 19%. And in addition to that, there is a 100% complete fissure. In this case, you also see there is a 100% complete fissure on the left side. However, what you also see is that the overall severity of emphysema is lower on the left side, despite that the left lower lobe is similarly affected. And also the heterogeneity is also a little bit lower on the left side. And this is the reason why we have opted for right lower lobe treatment. This is an implantation example that I just took from another patient that was treated just recently, about two weeks ago, in the right lower lobe as well. This is not the same patient as before. And I had the privilege to use the new um, platform from Olymp Olympus um, that enables fascinating uh, images and videos um, where you can see here how a valve is being implanted into a segment uh, of the right lower lobe. So that's the X1 platform that offers not only very additional features uh, that help in, in, in lung cancer diagnostics, in assessment of vessel, um, uh, vessel submucosal vessels that may be important after transponsive biopsy and bleeding. But in this particular case, just very simply enjoy the quality of the image itself and uh, how the valves are being placed. Uh, you can see here that we use basically the marks on the uh, catheter system uh, we have a, a, a large valve being placed here, a so-called nine millimeter valve uh, that is able to occlude particularly larger segments, for instance, in the right lower lobe. Uh, we've also used a, a smaller valve, a seven millimeter valve in segment uh, RB7 on the right side here. You see how you can very easily uh, move the deployment catheter into the, into the periphery. It's important to align the mark here with uh, the carina of the respective orifice uh, and then once you have decided when to place the valve to ensure that the ventilation uh, is not uh, jeopardizing the valve placement, you can very easily uh, place these valves and you see uh, how perfectly uh, they are suited. So in the case that I've just illustrated, you see evidence of uh, right lower lobe atelectasis. There is a uh, diaphragm, the right, the right uh, hemidiaphragm, which is elevated. Uh, you can also see that even much better on a CT scan, where there is a shift in the interlobar fissure. You very nicely see the right lower lobe atelectasis in this case. You also see um, how uh, overall there is a higher diaphragm here on the right side uh, compared than on the left, but uh, that is obviously to some extent normal where you really see volume reduction, obviously is the full evidence of atelectasis and uh, the interlobar fissure that has changed uh, its position. On lung function, there is a substantial improvement in lung function in this particular case. This is a patient that we've treated a couple of years ago. This patient continues to have an FEV1 above 50%, four years down the road now. Um, and uh, he uh, has, um, uh, she has improved largely. You see here, uh, residual volume was reduced uh, substantially. You see the FEV1 has increased uh, by up to uh, uh, sort of uh, up to 70% uh, predicted. And as you would anticipate, that is resulted and is associated with an increased, uh, not only exercise capacity, as you can see from the six minute walk test, but also in terms of uh, quality uh, of life. The second case is another female patient. She's a little bit younger. 
She's also a former smoker. She has uh, symptoms uh, of uh, COPD with an FEV1 uh, below uh, 30%. Uh, she has evidence of hyperinflation. And uh, she also had a history of an ICU stay with mechanical ventilation because of respiratory failure. And since the patient had persistent hypercarbia, uh, she received actually non-invasive ventilation for at least three months prior to assessment for valve treatment. This is also part of a recommendation from our best practice paper. Uh, on comorbidities, we have to refer to arterial hypertension, and this patient was also receiving full inhaler medication. On a CT scan, I hope you can see those images well, you can see bilateral upper lobe predominant emphysema with evidence of a complete fissure on the left side and an incomplete fissure on the right, a small benign nodule in the basal right upper lobe, which has been followed up before with no evidence of malignancy. And therefore we have opted to treat the patient in the left upper lobe. And what you can see here are X-rays done uh, right after valve treatment and in the subsequent days, you see uh, increasing evidence and uh, shift of the volume of the left upper lobe with um, also uh, developing atelectasis three months uh, down the road after valve treatment, the patient had full uh, atelectasis, lower atelectasis of the left upper lobe. And the consequence of this volume reduction was also similarly a large improvement in lung function, which was also associated with improvements in exercise capacity and quality of life that I'm not showing you here to you, uh, but I can assure you the patient did much better. On average, our experience shows that these patients continue to benefit for a few years at least. They may go uh, back to where they were after a couple of years given the natural progression of the disease, but offering these kind of treatments to patients that have a very impaired quality of life, that have a very low lung function, is a very, um, uh, a very encouraging uh, therapy that offers, uh, you know, a, a lot of um, a lot of options that these patients otherwise would not have, since the majority of these patients are not candidates, for instance, for lung transplantation and have no other options really. Uh, so to summarize this second patient case, um, this patient had a good clinical outcome. She had um, sort of a, a much more stable uh, situation. She did not. Um, has any further admissions because of severe COPD exacerbations uh, other than rather one um, hospital admission compared to the three admissions the year before. So this is a patient with uh, quite some benefits. And the third patient and the last patient I would like to share with you is another female patient. We also have male patients actually, but in this case, it's another female patient with a smoking history. She has stopped smoking for three years and there's also a discussion whether or not you would treat smokers or ongoing smokers. And I would have a clear no here because this is still a uh, treatment that includes implants in the airways where we want to reduce the infection risk and ongoing smokers should not be offered that treatment. That's my personal view. Uh, we've also included that view as part of our best practice paper. Uh, the CAT score indicates that this patient is highly symptomatic with evidence of severe airflow obstruction and hyperinflation. And in contrast to the previous patient, this patient has uh, her main emphysema um, severity in the right upper lobe, but there's also some emphysema in the left upper lobe. Uh, so there would actually be some potential here for treatment on the right side. And if the patient, for whatever reason, would not be a responder on the right side, there would potentially be even a backup treatment of the left side. So this patient underwent um, sort of uncomplicated treatment and implantation of valves to begin with. Um, she developed atelectasis, but unfortunately, she also developed uh, a chest, uh, um, chest pain, uh, symptoms and signs of a pneumothorax two days after valve treatment. We've treated that pneumothorax with a chest tube. Unfortunately, the patient continued to have an air leak, which required removal of one valve to ensure that the lobe is expanding again, and therefore the air leak uh, has been um, sort of stopped after some time because there is uh, once the lung that is previously collapsed hyper, uh, is, is inflated again, there is much more better um, adherence between the lung, the pleural surface, uh, the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, ensuring a cessation of the air leak. The chest tube was uh, removed, the patient was discharged in a stable condition, 
then the patient came back for another valve treatment. So the one valve that has been basically removed in the same position, uh, another valve was placed after uh, six weeks and the patient was followed up. What you can see here is a partial right upper lobe uh, atelectasis. So if you want volume reduction without evidence of atelectasis, but still improvements in lung function, as you can see here, FEV1 improved from 0.9 to 1.4. And also uh, this is depicted by a reduction in residual volume of around 600 mils, suggesting that there was uh, effective and successful lung volume reduction. Maybe at this stage, I would like to also comment on DLCO because I get uh, a lot of questions on DLCO, whether or not to use it as part of the assessment of patients and generally within the majority of experts that have treated many patients over the last uh, 10 years, uh, we have decided to not include DLCO as a mandatory assessment. It is usually being assessed, however, and it may be helpful in identifying high-risk patients, particularly those with homogeneous emphysema and a DLCO below 20% are certainly patients at a higher risk of complications. For instance, if they have a pneumothorax, they have much lower reserves and capacity, but uh, for the majority of cases, DLCO does not add much value. Again, a personal view, not everyone would agree with that. Uh, and usually we stick to all the other selection criteria that I have highlighted before. So to summarize, um, I hope that I've been able to convince you within this short presentation that endoscopic valve therapy for patients with emphysema has not only a high level of scientific evidence now, it is part and has been integrated into almost all national and international guidelines and the gold guidelines for our treatment now has an evidence level of grade A, but it is essential to have appropriate patient selection, uh, digital emphysema quantification, is uh, the main tool to target the right lobe and together with a multidisciplinary team, including radiologists and including thoracic surgeons, you can certainly make the right decision where to treat and potentially also how to treat, what technology um, and with appropriate pre and post interventional care. Uh, we have been able, fortunately enough, to help many patients over the last uh, 10 years so now this has been standard or is currently standard of care when patients are referred to us with emphysema and hyperinflation. Thank you for attention.